الحمد لله وكفى والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى أما بعض فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والذين جاهدوا فينا من أحذي أنهم سبلنا سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم any time a person begins to build up capital one of the things they worry about is how they're going to protect that capital so for example when a person starts making money then they start thinking about where they can put that money so that it's protected right either they think about putting it in a bank account or they might think about putting it in a safety deposit box or they might hide it someplace in their home but they're not going to leave it out in the open because they know that any time you have wealth there's a risk that someone can come and steal it that's just sort of a sort of common sense any time you start earning wealth or you start collecting wealth you begin to worry about it you begin to think twice what if this happens what if that happens so in the same way that that type of fear that you have is because of an uncertain possibility right you have this in your mind that there's a possibility that somebody might come and steal my wealth for example you know that there are thieves right thieves sort of wander in different neighborhoods and once in a while they hit a house in your neighborhood but you never know if they're going to come and hit your house for sure you just hear stories and you read things and you know that a thief might take your wealth right but imagine that if you knew that there was a thief that was just coming after you he knew that you had gold right there are those thieves by the way they watch where the indo packs live right within the community and then they know that those people keep gold in their houses right so they chase those people so when you, sometimes there's a thief that's specifically after you so in that case you're even more careful about how you preserve your wealth right most indo packs will always tell you anybody older than 30 40 will tell you never keep gold in your house right that's common sense because they know that that the thieves like to hit those houses where there's a potential to get a lot of gold quickly so the same is true with what has just passed in this last month we entered the month very poor our bank accounts were almost negative you can say we entered in debt many of us had made mistakes many of us were lacking in what we should have been doing really didn't really think we had much hope and all of a sudden the lust of hana huwa ta'ala showered us with the blessing of ramadan now that thief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave permission till the end of day of till the end of the day of judgment to do his craft that thief was locked up in his jail for the whole month right so with that thief gone we were able to collect up a lot of wealth each of you here has built up a tremendous amount of assets over the last 30 days or whatever now 27 28 days all the fasting that we've done is a, is a type of wealth all the coming to the masjid that we've done is a type of wealth the fact that we've thought about paying zakah and calculating our zakah is a type of wealth although you give away wealth you're actually gaining much more in return so now you've spent this month building up all this capital and all these assets and you have to recognize that there is a thief that is going to come after you come day 1 of the of the next month and they are perp- that thief is such a thief that he purposely will come after you and try to destroy you it's not a possibility issue it's a definite issue he will definitely come after you and he will definitely come eat after each and every one of us in this room so one of the fa- standard things that you need to consider is this is you can say this is a wealth preservation seminar okay this next few minutes basically now we've earned all this wealth right and you know when people they get they start amassing wealth they go to these seminars right wealth preservation seminars so in the same way we have to think about how we're going to preserve this wealth because there's a definite danger that exists come the first day of shawwal Actually the first day of Shawwal is very funny because you would think it would be the saddest day in our life. Every one of us should actually wake up crying on that day because one all the blessings of Ramadan ended, two Shaitan just got released. So both blows, those are the two heavy duty blows that occur within day 1. It should be the most depressing day. And that's the day that everybody should be at the doctor's office crying in depression, right? Thinking that we've just lost all this incredible incredible chances and incredible mercy of Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. But actually it's a day of celebration and I tell you the truth any reasonable rational rational mu'min would be crying his eyes out on that day he wouldn't be celebrating anything but it's so ironic that's actually part of being a servant at that time when we should cry most allah tells us to proclaim his praise and be happy we're actually commanded on the day of eid to be happy so that's the irony that's the irony of being of being a servant of allah sometimes you're told to eat you eat sometimes you're told to not eat you don't eat so 
Sometimes you're told, to, you're told to celebrate and you feel like crying, but you celebrate. Because you're a servant of Allah. That's actually, that's actually the most beautiful sign of being a servant. So, anyway, now that we've got this month and all these great blessings that have occur, occurred within this month, we need to talk about some things that will allow us to preserve what we've gotten. First, I want to talk about one very special blessing that we've earned. And then I want to talk about some things that are important in preserving what we've earned. There is something, a very special maqam. This isn't an average discussion. So it's a little bit high level, but inshallah you'll all understand it. There's a very special maqam. You know, when we talk about, um, if I sit here and tell you that, you know, you can become a sophomore, first you become a freshman when you go to college, then you're going to be a sophomore, then you're going to be a junior, then you're going to be a senior. That makes sense to everybody, right? Those are maqamat of the dunya, right? You earn something, you progress to the next level. Same way in the deen, there are maqamat. There are different levels that you progress to and you earn through your efforts. One of those maqam is called maqam al-mushahida. Maqam al-mushahida. Maqam al-mushahida is actually a maqam in which you begin to recognize the effects of your deeds. And actually the Sahaba lived in this state. I'll give you an example. Actually first you need to understand some background. Anytime you do a bad deed, something bad happens to you. There's always a reflective action within the universe. If you do something bad, you attract something bad back to you. And if you do something good, you attract the opportunity to do the next good. That's the general principle. In fact, it's, well, we'll talk about this in a minute, but that's the general principle. Now, what happens in our daily life, outside of Ramadan, let's say like, you know, two, three months ago, we do so many bad things, we make so many mistakes, that when bad comes upon us, we can't tell what action caused what. Right? It's so confusing. Because we woke up in the morning and we, maybe we argued with our parents before we left the house. Then we went out into the street and we looked at something we shouldn't look at, right? Then someone asked a question about how much we studied last night and we tell a lie and say more than what we really did, right? So two or three mistakes happen and then some bad things happen during the day and we can never tell what's causing what. It's just a big confusion. But if you actually look at the lives of the Sahaba, they were very much able to tell what, what one particular action resulted in when they made a mistake. For example, Hazrat Umar radiallahu anhu, right? Hazrat Umar radiallahu anhu says that the day I would make a mistake, I would be able to tell I made a mistake because when I got home, my wife would argue with me. Right? Imagine. So listen to what he's saying. He's saying, I could tell the day that I made a mistake because when I made that mistake, when I would get home later on in the evening, my wife would argue with me. That's called maqam al mushahid He does one thing in error. And then as a result, later on he sees the result of that error because everything else is so pure within his life. Similarly, some Sahabi also re relate this similar kind of instance. For example, they say, one, famous, well, one of the famous awliya in the history of Islam says that one day I saw the ankle of a woman. Right? He just saw the ankle of a woman and he says that I couldn't remember um, so many surahs that I had memorized. That's called maqam al-mushahida. One bad thing happened. And as a result, he sees the exact, he sees the result of his action immediately. Alright, similarly we see that some Sahaba, they will narrate that I, because I did this one thing, or even some of the Tabarin and Taba Tabarin narrate things like this, because I did act A, Allah took away the Hajjud for one month. Or Allah took, took away the Hajjud for 40 days. Right? And so that's called Maqam al-Mushahidah. And actually we see that in, uh, in Hadith as well, when, when we're told that when we eat something bad, the reflexive action is that it's, our du'as are not accepted, right? Similarly, I gave you another example just on two nights ago when we were here for the 27th night, or it's two nights ago. When we were here for the 27th night, I told you that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi told us that when you pray, your salah raises above your head. But for three people, it doesn't raise above their head. One of those people were those that argue with one another, that fight with one another, that hold discord in their heart for another. So there's a direct relationship, right? You do A, and then B occurs, meaning your salah doesn't rise. So that's called maqam al-mushahida. Now, to attain that maqam is a very difficult thing. It's a very, very difficult thing. And that maqam actually is a huge blessing. Because when you get to that maqam, then issues within the sharia become as light as, as day. For example, what happens is then you are at, let's say you're at that pure maqam where you don't do very many, make very many mistakes. All of a sudden, one day you go out, you eat food that's bad, now when you eat that bad food, the next day you find that you don't wake up for fajr, right? Now, think, now it becomes very clear. Now all of a sudden you know, you can think back and say, oh, oh, yesterday I ate that bad food. That's why I didn't wake up for fajr, 
right? Whereas if your life is all complicated and you don't wait for a budget, then you have 30 things to think about and you don't know which mistake resulted in what. So the benefit of maqam and mushahida is that for your, you it becomes a very practical instruction in what's causing what in your life. And in fact, this even exists. Many, many people will tell you about this. I can, I mean, I'll just relate one story. One time, just concerning food itself, um, my teacher used to tell me that when he was a student, during the break, the other students would go on, some of the students would go out for, you know, 40 days in Tablighi Jamaat, or 20 days in Tablighi Jamaat, and some of the students wouldn't during the break. So what would happen is the students who would go back in Jamaat, they would come back feeling all righteous, Right? Because obviously they went on the path of Allah, they spent time in the masjid, they've been doing zikr, they've been doing salah, they avoided sins, you're going to improve if you do those kind of things, those are the simple formula of the deen. So they came back very, very righteous. And then the other ones who didn't went, didn't go, they were a little bit more lazy. So the ones who went, and the ones who didn't go, then some, some differences started arising. Now normally the students just all become either very active together or very lazy together, but here now some difference arose. So the ones who would go would come back and wake the other ones up with the hajjahs and this and that and it would bother them. So one day they went to their teacher and they said, look, these students went on to belief and now they're driving all of us crazy. They just keep wanting to give bayans and keep wanting to wake us up with the hajjahs and we want to rest at this time. So the teacher said, well then just take them out to eat. Take them out to eat. Within three days their effects will be finished. They'll become just like you. So they took them out to eat. Day one, day two, day three, everything was done. They were equivalent. So in that particular case, that's another example of maqam al mushahida. Right? And the awliya, the people who are very close to Allah, they can relate one action with another. Now, in general, the Prophet ﷺ taught us a principle. And this principle is also present within the Qur'an. He who does good, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens the door for the next good. And he who does evil, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens the door for the next evil. So for example, if you look at something you shouldn't look at, then the door for the next thing opens up, the door for lying. It becomes very easy to tell a lie the next thing. Then the third thing, the door to do some other sin opens up. What happens is this is just a slippery slope and door by door opportunities arise. In fact, this is the understanding of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where the Prophet ﷺ says, if you ever do a bad deed, immediately follow it with a good deed. What does the Prophet ﷺ tell you? If you ever do a bad deed, your first response should be immediately to follow it with a good deed. Why? Because if you do bad deed A, the door to bad deed B opens up. And instead of going into that next door, if you follow it up with a good deed, then you shut the door to bad deed B, and you open the door to now good deed B. Do you see what the, the formula is? So here the Prophet is highlighting a paradigm in life, and that is, is that any time you do something wrong, the door for the next wrong opens up. And the way to shut that door and open the door to good is to follow it up immediately with a good. And so that's a very, very important hadith. Anytime we make a mistake, and that's one of the important things about Ramadan as well, anytime you make a mistake, immediately follow it up with a good deed. And that's why even a bit of sadaqah, at the end of the day, it extinguishes the fire. Even coming to salah, even coming to isha, in the masjid at the night, extinguishes the fire. Abu Bakr radiallahu an, famous companion of the Prophet he used, to, he used to scream to the companion. He would say, come to the isha prayer and extinguish the fire that you built during the day. Right? So again, this is just highlighting the same principle. Now, what happens in Ramadan is that you tend to develop a type of maqam al-mushahida. Obviously you don't develop it at the level of the sahaba, but your life becomes very simplified. Why? Because good deeds increased, and sin, sins decreased, and you've been in the masjid, you've been coming to the masjid, you've been fasting, especially if you've been in, in ihtikaf. So everything resets. Pretty much you, have, you don't have much opportunity to do bad over here. And pretty much any time you do do something bad, it's going to be followed up with listening to the Qur'an, sitting with one another, being in the masjid. Obviously all these other opportunities exist. So what ends up happening is you create a type of maqam al-mushahida within your own life. Now what's going to happen is when you go out there, that simplicity will remain. Once you return to outside of the month of Ramadan, that simpli simplicity will remain unless you destroy it. Now the first day what will happen is maybe Shaitan will challenge you with one sin. But that sin will be so vivid to you that you'll be able to directly feel its effect on you as well as directly feel the result of it. And anybody in the 10 day at the Gulf will know. The moment they go out they know that feeling because if you've experienced it once it's very vivid in your mind. You feel like someone stabbed you in the heart when you see that first thing that you shouldn't have seen. But when you hear that first thing you shouldn't have, shouldn't have heard. So again, you've had this opportunity to develop this maqam so take advantage of it. Because a lot of things in your life that you were confused about will become very clear to you if you just sort of use this as your principle. 
So when you go and eat the next time at some place, and you see that, okay, I ate this, and now I couldn't wake up for fudge the next day, it's a very direct dawa to you that maybe you shouldn't have eaten at that particular place. Or if you to go on the internet, you see that thing you shouldn't have seen, and then all of a sudden, the next day you don't wake up for fudger, it's a very clear dawah to you that that internet puts some heavy-duty weight on your heart. All right? It really veils you, and it shuts the door to the next good deed. So be very, very careful about how you handle your life. Now, so many people come to me outside of the month of Ramadan, and they say, well, how can I purify my life? How can I figure out what's going on? I can't tell anymore what's happening where. Well, this is the time you get to reset your life. And I always tell people, Ramadan is that chance when you get to reset your life. Now, so the goal actually is to retain this maqam al-mushahida. So keep that in mind. Now, all the wealth that you've obtained, the biggest thief is now going to be released. And he is going to come after you with a force that you have yet to experience, if you truly picked up anything in this month. Because he wants to rape you. And he wants to rape you of every single deed and every single good that you earn. That's his job. That's his purpose, and that's his drive in life. Not only will he rape you, he will double team and triple team you. He'll send, his, he'll send also his, his little shayatin after you as well, and will try to cause you to slip in every possible way, shape, and form. So there are some things to keep in mind that the Prophet ﷺ highlighted in order to retain the blessings of Ramadan. All right? And the very first begins the moment this, the moon is seen. So the moment that night, that first night of Eid, you know, obviously the night of Eid comes and then the day of Eid comes. That first night of Eid, it is sunnah, according to the Prophet them to spend that night in worship. All right? Now many people don't recognize this, but if you go through books of hadith and you talk about the nights that you should spend in worship, like the 15th of Sha'ban is one of those nights, the odd nights of Ramadan and all the last 10 days of Ramadan include those nights. Similarly, um, for, uh, there are other nights like this within our deen and one of those nights are the nights of the Eid now unfortunately what happens is the second we get out of here we begin to celebrate right? so the last thing in our mind is now we already did 10 days of Ibadah who's going to do an 11th day right? it's supposed to be Eid but actually it was sunnah of the Prophet to worship heavily on that night and that's because on that night when shaitan comes with extreme force see imagine that there's a person that you, got put, you put him in jail right? and he says to you when I get out I'm going to get you He's not going to wait five weeks after he gets out. He's going to come that night and get you, right? It's the same way, right? Your, your du'as, your, your weaknesses, Allah's mercy upon you is what puts Shaitan in jail. And he knows it. He knows that that's why he's tied up. He's not going to wait for day two. Day one, that night, he's going to come and get you. He doesn't even have that kind of patience to wait one day. So that night is a night that you need to put up a shield. That, that night is a night you need to defend yourself. Now what we end up doing, we end up starting to break the Sharia the very first night. The music starts in the home, the Mandy celebrations start, we start going out shopping and mixing with one another, and we forget the whole purpose of what the 30 days of fasting were about. Right? Now I'm not saying that you can't prepare yourself, enjoy yourself, be grateful to Allah for that night, but do it within the guise of the Sharia. Limit yourself to what the Sharia has limited you to, and you will always find safety within that. But the shield that you put up on that first night is going to be extremely important. So you'll see that the Prophet Sallallahu encouraged us to put up that shield on that first particular night by making sure that you pray on that night. So Ihya'ul Layl is actually one of the first things that you should keep in mind the day that Eid, the first night of Eid. Okay, the second thing that you have to do to protect yourself is to make sure that you pray Fajr that morning in the masjid. Now here you go, you spent 30 days training yourself Right? To pray Fajr in the masjid. You've been trying to come to Fajr in the masjid, and then on the day of Eid, you find few people. All of a sudden, the very first day, people begin to miss out on the habit, and often it's because they stayed up so late preparing for Eid that they end up sleeping through Fajr. Right? So you need to be very careful about that first Fajr. Why? Because the first Fajr is the key Fajr. Now, let me tell you something. If you go and bodybuild, I'm not an example of bodybuilding, but at least I know a little science behind it, right? So if you go and bodybuild, right? then you know that if you don't do weightlifting the very next day, you miss one day, the weightlifters will never miss one day. Because when they miss one day, they know, they know that it's going to have a huge nuksan. It's going to have a huge deficiency or defect on what they plan to do later on. So in the same way, that day when you actually had the opportunity to now solidify that habit outside the month of Ramadan, if you don't show up in the masjid, it's a huge loss. And what happens? The door to missing the next fajr occurs, and the door to missing the next fajr opens, and the door to missing the next fajr opens, Within one week, you have the same problem, I can't wake up for Fajr, right? Or if you're praying Fajr, you have the same problem, why can't I come to the masjid for Fajr? So 
So why lose out on this beautiful training that has occurred over the last 30 days? So really make a firm knee on your heart tonight. That that first fudger we're going to make sure we get here for. Because if you get here for the first one, the door for the second one will open. If you get there for the second one, inshallah, the door for the third one will open. And then who knows, Allah will bless you with a habit. Let me tell you, there's two types of people. There's one type of person, Allah wants them in fudger. No matter what, they always end up here. They always end up here. It's so ajeeb. They're sick, they wake up, they're here. And you always know those brothers. They're just the same few brothers that are always here no matter what happens. They're just regularly in fajr. And then there's another group of people that Allah really does, they make mistakes and they do it in such a way that Allah really doesn't care if they come to fajr or not. In the sense that Allah doesn't give them that tawfiq. Those people, no matter how much they try, they set the azan from Medina alarm clock, right? Latest alarm clock, $45 comes out, azan from Medina. They think that if I put one azan from Medina on my right hand side, one azan from Mecca on my left hand side, there's no way I'm going to miss fajr. They sleep through both azans, right? And that's because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't give them the tawfiq. So in the end, it's not about how many alarm clocks you have, or do you have a hard pillow or a soft pillow, right? Or is your mattress set to number three or number four? It's all about who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to wake up. And in the end, the only way you can become like that is by attracting the mercy of Allah to you. You have to beg him and say, Ya Allah, I'm your servant. If you wake me up and allow me to celebrate your praises at that time, then it's only your blessings that you allow me to do so. So Ya Allah, I beg and plead from you that at that basic level of ibadah, that you make me among those who are counted uh, as the people who pray in the masjid. So make, make that a habit, okay? Now, the other, thing, the other mistake is that we miss the Isha prayer the night of Eid, right? So what happens is Ramadan ends at Maghrib, but the Isha prayer is actually of Shawwal. So it's the exact same thing, same principle. Make sure you get to the masjid for Fajr, inshallah, and for Mok for Isha. Inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open the door for Fajr. So that's the second thing. So now that was just before the Eid. Now you get to the Eid prayer itself. Now what tends to happen is that when we start celebrating the Eid, then the Allah that we worship for the, all the rules of the Allah that we worship for 30 days, right, that He's established for us, they go out the window. And we often begin to break the rules of the Sharia in order to really enjoy that day. And that's actually a very dangerous thing. Because that's exactly what Shaitan wants. Right, the Allah that you spent 30 days, 28 days, 29 days engraving in your heart, all of a sudden, that the engravement uplifts within just a few hours. So you have to be very careful about how you handle the Eid prayer. Number one, you should encourage your wives and your daughters to dress properly. It can't be understated, the, um, the amount of unfortunate dressing that occurs at the Eid prayer. You, I, mean, we, it's, I, I don't even have to go into the details. Everybody knows what I'm talking about. That's how bad it is. I don't have to explain to any brother in this room what the situation is. Everybody can relate. So when everybody can relate, it means it's become so common that it's almost become just understood. And that's actually very unfortunate. So here we have like a group of people. I'm not saying you have to yell and scream at your family, but you just very gently need to advise them that, look, this is a day of celebration. This is a day of Islamic celebration. We should come dressed properly for the event, right? There's no reason to make yourself up. The only reason you put makeup on is to attract the attention of other people. We don't need to attract the attention of others on that day. We need to attract the attention of Allah. So if you want to make yourself up in something, make yourself up in the sunnah. Like I mentioned at the midnight talk a few days ago, it's the sunnah that is actually the makeup of the believer. Inherently, human beings are very, very deficient. If you look through the description of human beings through the Qur'an, if you look at the way Allah describes human beings through the Qur'an, they're, you know, ignorant, they're described as argumentative, they're described as being in a rush, they're described as making wrong choices. So many places Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes us in a negative light. Yet, at the same time, the Prophet says, Qul in kuntum tuhibbun Allah, fattabi'uni yuhibbkum Allah. If you love Allah, follow me, Allah will love you. So now, with all these deficiencies, you would think that there is no way that Allah should love us. Why should he love a, a bunch of deficient people? But the Prophet says, outlines the paradigm. Say, O Messenger of Allah, to your companions, in kuntum tuhibbun Allah. If you verily, verily, if you love Allah, Follow me, Allah will love you. So now this is highlighting a very essential equation within the deen, and that is, is that the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is attracted when we put on the makeup of the sunnah. Right? We have deficiencies, and anybody who has deficiencies, they make themselves up very carefully. If a woman has a scar over here, she spends a good half hour covering that scar with makeup when she makes herself up if she wants to attract the attention of her husband. 
In the same way, if you want to attract the attention of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, despite your deficiencies, despite your sins, then the way you do it is by making yourself up with something called the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's established by the Qur'an. That's the paradigm. There's no way around it. Anytime you put on a sunnah, you beautify yourself. Anytime you beautify yourself, it is a type of beauty that atta- attracts Allah's attention. One beauty is the beauty that we attract one another's attention with. I drive a nice car. Everybody says, MashaAllah, brother, where'd you get that car? Right? Well, that's a very nice car. When did that car come out? Right? So now you attract the attention of people. That doesn't attract Allah's attention, that car. What attracts Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's attention is actually when you make yourself up in the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa when you live according to the sharia of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So keep that in mind that the makeup on that day is not the makeup of silk clothes. It's not the makeup of mascara and eyeliner. It's not the makeup of a tie and a suit. It's the makeup of the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's what will attract Allah's love towards you. When you become the beloved of Allah, then Allah loves to see his beloved in the masjid. He will automatically put you in the masjid. Right? When you really love someone and they're not there, then you ask, where is that person? You always ask, where is that person? If your, pa- if your parents have a party and they invite you and they invite your daughter, their granddaughter, and they don't see the granddaughter and the, when you first walk in the door and they say, my, they always say, for example, my, my daughter is Fatima. Where's Fatima? Did she come? Where's Zakaria? He's obviously hanging on me. But where is Zakaria? Did he come? Why? Because they have a very deep love and they always want to know where he is, right? So in the same way, what happens is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you become the beloved of Allah, He wants you here. He brings you here. That's the person that gets woken up, right? When they're sincere and they make an effort. It doesn't matter what level you're at. It doesn't mean that you have a beard down to your knees, right? But what it means is that there's sincerity within you, that you have some sort of submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's actually what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at. Okay, anyway, so keep that in mind. So that means, that's the second point. The first point was to take care of what happens before you. Make sure you come to Isha, make sure you pray Fajr. The second point is to protect the celebration itself, which tends to be a very, very dangerous place. Now, remember another thing, and this is for the men in the room, and it's a very, very deep piece of advice, and actually, Sheikh Zulfakar, my teacher, told me this advice, and wallahi, if I could write this advice in gold and give it to each of you, you would be able to keep it to pass it on for generations to come. One day he was sitting with me, and he said a very, very beautiful statement. He said, in this day and age, women don't do hijab anymore. Very few women are going to do hijab. So the only way to solve the problem is you should just do hijab from them. And that actually, subhanAllah, is a very deep piece of advice. Actually, the issue arose was that one of the uh, students of Sheikh Zulfiqar asked Sheikh Zulfiqar that if a woman calls me and she has to ask me a lot of questions and inter- interact with me on the phone, and should I interact with her or not? That was the question that got raised. And he said, basically the principle is you should not in- over-interact with her because it creates a dependence between two people and Allah can put anything in anyone's heart, we're all weak. So he said, instead I advise you that you tell them to connect themselves to the women scholars within the community. You tell them to connect themselves with your wife because she's a righteous person and inshallah she'll benefit. And he said, it's a general principle in my life. If any woman wants to talk to me in private, I tell her to talk to my wife. If she says, no, 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 this is something I can only tell you, then I tell her that if, it's something, if this is something that I, uh, my wife can't handle, then I can't handle it as well. And he said that the principle behind this is actually that there is not, women don't know how to do hijab anymore. Most women. Isn't that, mashallah, Allah puts it in the hearts of certain women. So if women don't know how to, how to do hijab anymore, the only way to save yourself is to do hijab from them. Okay? That's the only way now the hijab is going to exist. So you need to be very careful about how you interact in, in this particular day and age because it's a very dangerous thing. For you Hafaz and you young people, the internet and all these things, each of us knows what's going on on the internet. And you know how dangerous it can become. One chat room with ten people, the eleventh sister comes in, the twelfth sister comes in and everybody's chatting together in the chat room. Everybody thinks it's benign, but inside it's very, very dangerous and it destroys your hearts. Similar with, similar with the cell phone. Uh, my, again, my sheikh says, Zulfakar, my teacher, one of my teachers, I have many, but one of my main teachers, he says, this is not a cell phone. This is a hell phone. Right? Because what it does is, parents, the kids have, everybody has a cell phone. Every 8, 9, 20, you know, 12 year old person has a cell phone. And the parents have no idea what talking is going on. And you parents in the room think that, no, I know. You don't know because your kids come tell me, they don't tell you. They come and tell me who they're talking to. They come crying to me on the 27th night of Ramadan that I've been talking to such and such and so on, so now what do I do? So actually, parents think that everything is fine because they look at their child in the most perfect light. Anytime you look at your child by nature, parents look at their child perfectly. They say, my child, what's going to happen to him? He's masoom. He doesn't even know how to do anything wrong. 
Actually, they don't realize. I'm the one who realizes, and I'm not going to tell any of you after the talk what's going on, but I'm just telling you that I realize, because they come and tell me, right? Because they feel that I, they can relate to me. So what happens is they come and tell me what's going on. I get the emails when the sister says, I'm madly in love with this brother, he's a hafiz, what do I do? Right? Now what do I tell her that she does? Become a hafiz by yourself, maybe he'll fall in love with you. What am I supposed to, what am I supposed to advise her? Right? And actually all of this arises from, it's funny, but it's serious. Actually all of this arises from the cell phone. You don't know until you get the bill. You know, you open up the bill and you see that 3,200 minutes were spoken, right? Because it's nice and weekends are free. So then what happens? Then you begin to realize, but usually unlisted number, because these kids are smart. They know how to block each other's numbers so it doesn't show up on the bill. Anyway, these kids really know. I mean, this is actually not the kid's fault. It's the environment. But you need to be a little bit careful about what's going on. And I'm not even talking to the parents. I'm talking to the children in the audience. You people who are hofaz, you have the greatest gift that any man can attain. There is no greater gift in the world than anybody can attain. I'm telling you, nobody can, no, I can stand up and honestly say it. Maybe nobody else can, because I've gone through medicine, and I've also gone through the Alam course. And actually, I don't have hips, but it's one of the biggest deficiencies I see within myself. And that's one of the, I, I have so many other assets, but that's the one asset that I would trade everything to have that. So I can tell you right now that you young Hufaz, that gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed you with, that is the most valuable thing you will ever obtain in your life. And on the Day of Judgment, it will be the greatest gift. Allah will just tell you, read, and you will read until you continue to fly and ascend in the heavens until you're done reading. That's hadith. Right? You know that the Prophet says, and not only that, but I'll tell you, for the parents who are trying to preserve their kids, that hiss is your key ticket to Jannah. Because it's also in hadith that the hafiz will be able to intercede for X number of people who were destined to go to the hellfire. Right? Now, that hafiz is a true hafiz, not the one who didn't practice, not the one who forgot what he learned. So for parents, it's essential that they create an environment that results in preservation of that Qur'an. So all of you young students here in the room who are doing his, who have done his, for you, you have to defend that goal. That is the greatest asset. That is your greatest asset, and Shaitan wants to destroy it. You have to understand, it's just a very simple thing. So look, the internet, the PS2, and the cell phones, these things are your enemies. Right? These things are your enemy. Your PS2, you can put in 10, 8 to 10 hours a day, and you just lose your time. That could have been spent, time, spent in revising the Qur'an, in learning about the, the language of the Qur'an, in learning about the, about the deen that's presented in the Qur'an, and instead 8 to 10 hours every day goes into PS2. I think that the PS2 in the back room must have burnt out by now. It's been running constantly since the ethic out. Right? So that this portable PS2 has come into the, at least it's non-masjid. So at least I asked those kids to take it out of the masjid and take it into cafeteria. So Jazakallah, they didn't that much. But anyway, what I'm saying is that this is your time, it's your life, it's your asset, you use it properly. So what I was basically saying was that you need to remember that you need to protect yourselves immediately. And on that celebration, now if you have to go to the Eid prayer, and you know that it's going to be a big mess at the Eid prayer, the next thing you have to do is that you have to keep your eyes down. The brother who comes to me and complains and says, SubhanAllah, I went to Eid prayer, Brother Hussein, it was so bad, actually he made a mistake. How does he know it was so bad? It means he looked at everything to see how bad it was, right? So the person thinks that they're doing a favor and that they're criticizing and showing how much they know, and in the back of mind, I'm, think, I'm thinking he didn't do his job. The, the women weren't going to do his job anyway. He didn't do his job. He shot himself in the foot, right? So actually, you need to remember that actually it's your job to do his job. You shouldn't even know what's going on at the youth prayer. Your eyes are down. You go in there. You pray. You keep your eyes down. You get out. You don't know what happened, right? You go in and you go out. It's just like, you know, if you're in a war and somebody's shooting at you, you just duck and run as fast as you can in and out. It's the same thing. Right? You have to be careful because your, eye, your eyes are being shot at in that particular gathering. Anyway, so that's the second thing, and that's protecting the celebration. The third thing that's also established by the sunnah is the fact that the Prophet ﷺ encouraged fasting on the six, six days of Shawwal. Very, very beautiful. So here the Prophet ﷺ made a very interesting comment. He states in Sahih Hadith, that the individual who fasts six consecutive fasts in shawwal, actually the wording is just six fasts of shawwal, not even the word consecutive. The person who fasts six fasts of shawwal, and they, they, they first fasted Ramadan, and then they followed that Ramadan with six fasts of shawwal, the Prophet says that that person receives the reward of fasting for an entire year. Okay? So now what you have to do is you have to attach six more to Ramadan in the month of shawwal. So here the Prophet is actually highlighting that what you need to do is immediately, when the, most of, when the most of the community stops fasting, 
And shaitan now comes after you with a vengeance, at that time you need to reinstitute fasting to protect yourself. So that if you protect yourself with six days of shawal, what actually happens is shaitan cools down in that time. That's the benefit. And you receive the reward of one year of fasting. The ulama, they've explained it very beautifully. They say basically you fasted 30 days in Ramadan, and then you add uh, another six days in shawal. So that's 36 fasts times 10 reward for each fast equals 360 days, which is about the length of the lunar calendar. So this is the way the ulama explained that hadith. But basically, spiritually what's happening is that at that moment when shaitan is about to attack you, right, and you need to put up a defense, you put up the defense of fasting. And what do the Prophet say about fasting? Jannatun. It's a shield. It's a shield. So what happens is the, shield, the fasting becomes a shield for you against who? Against your arch enemy who is now coming after you with extreme vengeance. So make it a habit to fast, fast the sixth of shawal. There's a couple other benefits that, are, that arise with shawal that I should briefly mention. Number one, it's almost an inherent means of the deen to help you make up your fast, particularly for women. Now you know that when a woman is in her monthly cycle, she's not allowed to fast. So usually there's some woman, whether she be a young girl or whether she be your wife, that's in your household that missed probably five or six fasts. So what this does, this hadith, actually recreates the environment of fasting for six more days. Now when that environment is recreated, what happens? The sister is going to fast to make up the missed fast, and you're going to fast either to make up some fast that you missed in the past in your life, or to earn the full reward of shawal, right? The actual, actual extra year of fasting. So the deen actually inherently builds within it a very easy way to make up those fasts. And I'll tell you something, just out of honesty and experience, and I think everyone in this room can relate, if you don't make up those fasts quickly, it's very unlikely that you'll make up those fasts later on. Because you lose the energy, you lose the excitement, you lose all the development that occurred within Ramadan, then you try to make them up in February and it becomes very, very hard. It becomes very hard to try to fast in February. So it's as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created a proper, ve- a proper vehicle for us to make up those fasts. Now just one word to the women, because I know some are listening on the phone, and some may be listening in the back, and for a word to the brothers who, who need to make up previous fasts, when you make up a missed fast, the primary intention has to be the missed fast. So you can't say, I'm fasting the missed fast, and I also want, I'm also fasting the sixth of shawal. Because you already owed that fast, so you can't ask for something extra. What you can do is this. You can say, Ya Allah, I am making up my missed fast. Your blessed messenger said that the person who fasts six extra fasts of shawal, they receive the reward of a full year of fasting. So Ya Allah, although I'm making up my previous fast, I'm choosing this particular day to do so because of the words of your blessed messenger. So if your treasure sees fit, bestow me with that reward as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his treasure is so vast that he can easily give you that reward as well. It would decrease his wealth in no way, shape, or form. So anyway, that's an important thing to keep in mind as well. Now, the other thing to remember is that the month of Ramadan is like a detailing center. During the month of Ramadan, the masjid becomes a detailing center. Now what happens, most people... Most people, not everyone, but many people, they take their car to the detailer once a year. Sometimes once a year, sometimes twice a year. You know what the detailer is, right? The detailer is that person who takes your car, he charges you $100, $120, and then from head to toe he cleans that car. They clean the seats, they clean every single aspect of the car, and they make it look like new. That's called detailing, right? So basically what happens is that once a year you get to come to the masjid when it becomes a detail center. You come into this masjid on the first day of Ramadan, you come with a lot of deficiencies, you come with scratches and scrapes and mud, you come with a dirty engine, right? You come with all of, you come with dirty feet, right? And then all of a sudden, during this month, you become purified, you become clean, and you enter almost like brand new. So here this became a detailed center, right? The masjid became like a detail center. Now your detailing is done for the whole year. Once in a lifetime, you get detailed at Hajj. That's a big time detail. You come up brand new. It's like a new car. But also once a year you get detailed every Ramadan. But beyond that, you have to also recognize that once you get your car detailed, it doesn't mean you're never going to get a car wash. You still need to go every week, every day, every two days, whatever your habit is, depending on the weather, to the car wash. And it depends on what? The weather. Same way it depends on the deen. If the weather is very difficult, you're getting blasted with your vision, you're getting blasted with your hearing, you're getting blasted with the internet, you're getting blasted with your cell phone, mistake after mistake occurs, you need to go wash your car more regularly. If you happen to be a hafiz, studying in the Qur'an, you're sitting in the madrasa all day, you're, you're relatively exposed to rel- relatively fewer sins, then you, maybe you need to get washed less, less often. Anyway, the deen has already built in the car wash as well. 
the detail center is built in, and the car wash is built in. And the car wash is masjid in, uh, salah in the masjid. One time one of the Sahaba came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said, Ya Rasulullah, I just did a horrendous thing. I did a horrendous thing. I interacted with a woman which, in, in a way that should not have occurred. Now this wasn't zina, this was just touching or something along those lines. So he said, Ya Rasulullah, I have to tell you, I have to tell you, he came in a panic mode. That Ya Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, I just interacted with a woman in a way that was completely inappropriate. So the, he said, punish me, punish me. So the Prophet said, he said, sit down. So the Sahabi sat down. Then the Prophet said, was sitting with his companions, some time passed, the time for prayer came, they prayed the prayer in Jama'ah. After they prayed the prayer in Jama'ah, it was a habit of the Prophet to go to his home and pray the Sunnah prayers there. The Prophet got up and started going to his home. When he headed to his home, the Sahabi jumped up. Ya Rasulullah, did you forget what I told you? I just interacted with that woman. You're supposed to punish me. I'm waiting. Punish me. The Prophet said that the Salah washes away what occurred between the two Salahs. SubhanAllah. So the Salah is a car wash. Every time you come to the Masjid and you pray in Jama'ah, it washes away the previous sins. And I'll tell you, having the Masjid is actually the most beautiful way to purify us. Why? Once the Salah is done or once you come in for the Salah, you shake each other's hand. SubhanAllah, even in that there's washing. The Prophet ﷺ told us that when two believers shake hands, as long as they hold each other's hand, sins fall. And I'll tell you, when I make a mistake, and everybody makes a mistake, although I'm sitting on the member, I make as many mistakes as you. We're all the same. When I make a mistake, I purposely come into the masjid and shake everybody's hand in the masjid and hold their hand for an extra second. Why? Because I know that that's one more way by which I can purify myself so I'm so thankful that there's a community here that prays in the masjid that I know that these brothers, brothers are blessed and Allah puts them in the masjid and I come and I try to shake their hand whether it be this masjid or Mecca masjid or whichever masjid is in your, your locality so that is a great blessing so recognize that the deen inherently washes you but you have to be conscious of it you make wudu it washes your sins right? you pray in jama'at it washes your sins you walk to the masjid it washes your sins Walking to the masjid washes your sin. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ said that the person who walks to the masjid, with every footstep, a sin drops and a darja is obtained. They increase, they get a good deed as well. Now, if this hadith was spread around the community, we would never make another car announcement ever again. Actually, the problem with the car announcements is not the size of the parking lot. The problem is we don't teach this hadith. Because actually, the Prophet ﷺ said that if you come on an animal, that doesn't apply. If you come on an animal every, you know, people like to say every mile counts, there's so many footsteps, that's not true. Clearly in hadith, the Prophet said that the man who comes on an animal, that does not apply until he gets off the animal and walks. So the car is like an animal. When you drive, you're not receiving that reward. When you park and walk, every footstep is what brings you that reward. So actually the fight should be to park on the street. The problem should be, brother, two brothers are blocking in the street, there's ten open spots in the lot, please move your car. <laughs> that should have been the problem, right? But actually the problem is reversed because we don't understand the hadith. So whenever you get the opportunity, number one, think in your mind, subhanAllah, there are elder brothers in the masjid. They need to use the parking lot more than I do. Number two, they, those people are much more pure. They have become white in Islam. I'm still young and energetic and I perform sin with that much energy. So park your car a bit further and walk. It's only going to benefit you. One, you get the reward of respecting your elders because now you open the spots for them or, or any brother, whether it be an elder or not. And number two, you get the reward yourself of walking, which we all know we need that washing more than anyone else, right? So anyway, the point is, is that the Ramadan is a detail center, but that doesn't mean that you're not going to get your car washed again. And the place to get your car washed is the masjid. Regularly attend the masjid and inherently you'll always remain clean. All right. Now the next thing is to remember that you should fast other days besides the six of Shawwal. The Prophet ﷺ, he treated fasting as a medicine. And you can see it very, very clearly in his hadith. The Sahaba say, sometimes we saw the Prophet ﷺ fasting so regularly that we thought he would never stop. And other times we saw the Prophet ﷺ fast, not fasting that we thought he would never fast again. And actually what this is highlighting is that fasting is a type of medicine. Sometimes you begin to recognize a weakness in yourself. Sometimes you begin to see that you're going down a path that you shouldn't go down. Sometimes you begin to see, for example, you missed one or two fajrs in the masjid, but whereas your habit is to come to the masjid. Those are the days that you begin fasting. Increase your fasting a couple days. That fasting will burn away the sins that you have done so quickly that it will rectify everything that was your normal habit. So when you begin to see that there is some deficiency arising in your life, there's some mistake that's plaguing you, follow it up with a couple days of fasting. If you do so, you'll begin to attain purity and re regain the schedule that you hope to, to follow. 
Anyway, there are many other things that I can mention, and it's getting late, and I've been speaking for a long time. But these are just some common things to keep in mind, right? To increase your acts of worship and to avoid sin. And actually, to tell you the truth, if there was one thing that I would advise you to do, it's to avoid sin. Because once you're a Muslim, you inherently move along the path. The Muslim, by default, automatically approaches Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by being Muslim. The problem in our life is not the fact that we don't do good deeds. All of us have good intentions. We pray, we come to the masjid as much as we can, we respect our elders, we do the best we can do. That's not the problem. The problem is, is that along with being good, we perform sin. Now imagine, if I put my car in neutral and I slam on the gas, I'm not going to go anywhere no matter how much I rev the engine, right? Because the car is in neutral, the, ga- the, ga- the, the gear is not engaged. Similarly, if I have a ship, right, and I throw an anchor down and I anchor that ship at the port and then I press on the accelerator of the boat, right, the way they accelerate their engines, the ship's not going to go anywhere. So although you might be accelerating in your life by trying to do good deeds, what's happening is that most of us are tied down by that anchor. Now, everybody's anchor is different. Some people, they, now you have to be 100% untied to move forward. 99% we do. It's that one sin that plagues everybody. And what's, uh, what's ironic is everybody has a different sin. Everybody in this room has something that plagues them. For one person, it might be pride. For another person, it might be their eyesight. For a third person, it might be the way they use their tongue. For a per- fourth person, it might be their addiction to what they li- listen to with their ear. For the fifth person, it might be the foods they like to eat and the fact they shouldn't eat them. Everybody has something, and it's not for us to judge one another. We overlook one another's faults, and we hope that by doing so, we hope that Allah will overlook our own. So this is not a judgment session, but what it is reminding us of is that everybody has this anchor. And so it's your job to reflect back in your life and say, what's my anchor? Right? I'm doing these deeds, and I'm supposed to move forward. What's the anchor that's holding me down? And if you think honestly and seriously reflect deep in your heart, you'll find it. You'll find it. Nobody else needs to tell you. You'll find it. So reflect on that and especially now in this month of Ramadan when things have become so pure and you begin to see the advancement that occurs I mean everybody is advancing mashallah you can see changes in people over these last 28 days so now take that last step and think what is the anchor that's holding me down and make a sincere niyyah tonight or tomorrow night or sometime during this period that ya Allah I am absolutely weak ya Allah I am absolutely helpful, helpless I have no strength I have no power and I am just plagued by this particular issue. So, Ya Allah, if you, with your strength and your wisdom and your power and your ability to decree, if you decree for me to leave that sin, then verily I can leave that sin. And if you make the dua like that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves to show his power. He loves to show his mercy. He loves to show that he can take an individual who looked like the most rotten in the community and he can make him the best example of anyone in the community. He loves to show his power in that way. So if you stand up, lowering yourself and raising the great name of Allah and make that near that I want to change and I'm going to make some steps to change, Ya Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open the door. It's impossible. It is mathematically impossible that a person make a step to change and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not change them. A sincere step to change. So anyway, these are just a few points about keeping the blessings of Ramadan. Actually, one of the brothers, I, was, I didn't even know what I was going to talk about before I sat down here. One of the brothers, he just approached me an hour ago and he said, you know, can you please talk about retaining the blessings of Ramadan? Right when he said that, in my mind, I also thought, subhanAllah, that's a very appropriate topic. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give him the tawfiq to implement everything that I mentioned because actually it was through his questioning that, this, that these ideas arose and that I was able to give this short discussion. And that, that's how the Sahaba work. When they questioned in sincerity, the Prophet uh, gave many, many details of the deen to the companions. And so the same thing happens when somebody questions in sincerity, they really, really have a deep desire to preserve what they gained here. Allah tends to accept it from the entire group. And so perhaps these words today will have an effect on you and me, like perhaps they may not have had on another night. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among those who, who believe. May He give us the tawfiq to leave our sins. May He give us the tawfiq to regularly wash ourselves by being regular in this masjid. May He give us the tawfiq that we become regular in recitation of the Qur'an, that we become regular in our attendance of circles of knowledge, and that we become regular in raising His great name. May He give us the tawfiq that we see our children follow this path as well. And may He protect their generations and the generations after them when we won't be around to, to watch what will really happen in that difficult day. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that when we're in our grave, He forgive our shortcomings. 
that he give us the tawfiq to answer the questions of the angels on that day and that he widen and expand our grave in such a way that we have a window open to Jannah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he protect, protect us from the constriction of the grave. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he protect us from the difficulty of the day of judgment. When just the judge, judgment alone will be so overbearing that we won't even be able to stand to await what the result will be. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that on that day when there is no shade that he place us under his shade. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that on that day when there is nothing to drink that he give us to drink from his blessed fountain. And that on that day when there is no light that he make our deeds a light for us. And on that day when we have to cross the path that runs over hellfire, that he make that, qu- that, he make that crossing very quick and, very, and with minimal difficulty. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he make us among those who, whose deeds are not even accounted, but rather were placed directly in Jannah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he not allow us the difficult, difficult vision of seeing our family members go into Jahannam. And we even ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he preserve us from the more difficult vision of having our family, family members watch us go into Jahannam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he give us the tawfiq to submit to every aspect of the sharia, that he increase our understanding in the sharia, and that he increase our ability to share that understanding with others within the community. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that for whoever was here today, that he give them the tawfiq to practice on what was just preached, and that whoever was not here but intended to be here or had some desire to be here, or even has a desire to preserve whatever they obtained during the month of Ramadan, that he give this tawfiq to them as well. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he raise his great name through us, and that, not, that he not select another group of people to do so. The question here is not who's, that Allah, whether the name of Allah will be raised or not. The question is who Allah will choose to do so. So we beg and plead that Allah select us for that job. Because it's when he selects us for that job that when we attain great blessings on the Day of Judgment. We ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among those who submit to the sunnah of the Prophet We ask that he make us among those who are recognized by the Prophet on the Day of Judgment. The Sahaba asked the question, Ya Rasulullah, how would you recognize the people that you never met? The Prophet had explained that it would be through our deeds, through our wudu which shines our hands, through our wudu which shines our face, through our wudu which shines our feet. So we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to be recognized by the Blessed Messenger on that day. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he place us in the company of the Prophets in Jannah and that he place around us all of our family members so that we can truly enjoy, enjoy his great blessings on that day. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if there's anyone in this room that has any difficulty that Allah upraise, uplift it. If anyone's looking for a job that Allah give them a job. If anyone's looking for a means of escaping haram that Allah open that means to escape haram. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that for the students in this room that he increase their ability to learn so that they become model and examples in their field. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that for the young hufaz in this room that he protect their Quran and that he make them among those who are solid and regular in both practice and recitation of that book. We ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raise from amongst us scholars and people who practice and preach what they teach. We ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among those who truly believe. That he give us the light of iman and that he give us the taste of it as well so that we're not distracted by the other tastes that are present within this dunya. We ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless our wives, give us offspring that, are, that become the coolness of our eyes, give us the tawfiq that we have a lot of wealth so that we can give a lot of zakat. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he open our wallets to charity. At that difficult time when shaitan begins to say, well, what would you do if you gave an extra hundred dollars? We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he lighten that load. Make us, make us among those who give charity so that he can continue to bless us so that we can continue to give more. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the young people in this room that he save them from the difficulties of the time. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he give us a tawfiq to control our tongues, to control our eyes, to control our ears, to control our hands, and to control our feet. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he make us among those who are true in deeds and true in words. ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وكنا عذاب النار اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم يا الله verily there's a group of people that ask that uh, ask either myself or ask other people in this audience to make dua for them we ask that you accept whatever dua they were seeking we ask that you grant them whatever they were looking for and we ask that you give them a death on iman and that you raise them in the day on the day of judgment as one of those who truly believe ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وكنا عذاب النار اللهم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم سبحان ربك رب العزه عما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين امين 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 برحمتك يا ارحم الراحمين